Hi everybody, I'm Nate Eaton here with the Chief Deputy for the Canyon County Sheriff's Office, Doug Hart. If you followed the Daybell case, uh, you knew that he testified in both trials, both Chad and Lori Daybell's trial, in the capacity, I guess, of, as a retired FBI agent? Correct. I appreciate you talking with me today. Just so people understand why you're now the Sheriff's Office versus the FBI, talk me, talk me through uh, what brought you here. You bet. I spent 27 years with the FBI in various assignments. Um, I was involved in the Daybell case in my capacity as the what they called the supervisory senior resident agent, uh, which is a mouthful, but it basically means that I was in charge for the criminal programs for the FBI for the southern 34 counties of Idaho, which included a, a satellite office in Pocatello. Um, but uh, as I was um, Moving towards the end of my FBI career, the Canyon County Sheriff uh, called and, and offered me a position to be his chief. Uh, he and I had had a long association for, for many years, and so uh, the timing was right, and, and so I accepted that position. Um, Love law enforcement, wanted to stay in law enforcement, and this was an opportunity to serve in a different capacity, so I uh, made the move about two years ago. Awesome. Okay, so let's go back to 2019, I imagine, is when you first became aware of the two missing kids, JJ and Tylee. Yes. Is that what, is that what started the FBI's involvement into all of it? Yes. So um, I got a phone call, uh, I believe it was November 27th of 2019. Uh, it was after the Rexburg Police Department had done their welfare check and subsequent uh, search warrant and found the apartment had been abandoned. Um, and some of our agents uh, who work with the Rexburg Police Department, our, our Pocatello office agents, had been uh, in contact with the Rexburg Police Department. And uh, we, you know, uh, indicated that there was a need for us to be involved uh, due to the potential of two missing children. What do you think when that first you get that call or you got that email, what's the first thing that goes through your mind? Um, well, the, you just don't know very much at that point. And so that phone call, the agents who had responded were very concerned. They said, this is really strange and, and we're, we, we can't account for the whereabouts of these two children. And so uh, when you get something like that, there are a number of steps that you take uh, in terms of uh, a missing child case and protocols to follow. And so that's what we initiated. So at the onset, I didn't, you know, I, I, had, no, I had no idea, no concept of what we were about to get into. Uh, but knew what steps we needed to take as far as the FBI is concerned in arranging to um, work cooperatively with our uh, state and local partners um, in a case where kids were missing. So that was the end of December, you said the 27th? Of November. Of November, end of yeah. November. It okay. was the day before Thanksgiving. Okay, day before Thanksgiving. And at what point do, does uh, your involvement as far as like boots on the ground, letting the public know that these kids are missing, I mean there's a series of steps you take. Um, and I guess you just start working through those steps. Immediately. Our involvement began immediately. So we, we, um, we opened a case um, under a classification for, for kidnapping, which is the federal nexus to this. Uh, and then our agents began participating very quickly with Rexburg Police Department's uh, inter interviewing, uh, you know, Ian Pulowski, Melanie Boudreau, uh, you know, anybody that, that's, that's what you start, is you, you, you start examining every potential uh, avenue that might generate information to indicate the whereabouts of those children. So this case concurrently had just a massive number of tasks being performed by a wide variety of people. So, um, that that's that's how you initiate that that process so you don't do one thing at a time there's probably 10 or 15 things going on all at the same time by different personnel so you do those interviews 
And you hear, from what I recall, it was Ian Pulowski when he kind of came in and said, I married my new wife, and the night of our honeymoon, of our wedding, she says all this stuff about, right. like, dark zombies, spirits. I, I would imagine that raised some alarm bells. Oh, absolutely. For sure. That was uh, very important information uh, that he provided and um, agreed to cooperate with us in, in making some recordings, uh, which were very valuable in establishing uh, some of the doctrinal uh, foundations and, and, you know, it, it wasn't the smoking gun. It didn't say, you know, none of those recordings said what had happened to the children or where they were or who had done anything or, or if, in fact, anything had been done. But we were able to ascertain um, the sort of the, I don't want to say philosophy, but sort of where we got insight into the inner circle that I, I guess is the word I, I would use uh, from, from those recordings. And it uh, solidified that there was something going on here with these people. It didn't tell us what had happened to the children, but clearly we, we had a group that was cooperating with each other. Did you think the kids were alive? In those situations, um, y you have to proceed with that hope and as if they are alive until proven otherwise. There's a lot of situations where a, a child goes missing where I think you're crestfallen and, and you feel like this isn't going to end well, but you have to, you have to believe you, because sometimes miracles happen and sometimes y you, y you know, they, they're recovered. Uh, right. Sometimes they, you find them. I, was, um, I wasn't an active participant, but our, our division handled the Elizabeth Smart case. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget a year after her disappearance when it was announced that she had been located. Right. And so those stories are real. Th those, those things exist, and so you have to, you have to proceed uh, as, if, as if those kids are alive and, and it's your job to find them, and that, it, that is a tremendous, uh, it gives a tremendous sense of urgency to everyone who's working on the case. So word gets out, or you release, you or uh, Rexburg PD, I believe, uh, release the, the news release. Mm -hmm. These kids are missing. Parents are in Hawaii, mm -hmm. or not cooperating with investigators. What's happening behind the scenes? Up in, up in those uh, two or three months, what can you tell us before Lori's arrested? Yeah. While they're still over there on the beach, I imagine you all are strategizing, trying to figure out which uh, approach to take. Well, we're, we're actively working the case on multiple fronts. So um, a number of interviews are being conducted by the Rexburg Police Department, the FBI, the Fremont County Sheriff's Office. We're following up on leads and tips that are coming both outside of the state and inside the state, so we had to follow up on all of those things. Uh, a number of search warrants were obtained for uh, phone numbers and um, Google, and we, we had the iCloud account uh, that had been uh, secured uh, in Arizona, so we had a copy of that that we were reviewing. Um, we had our cast analyst initiate his work to try to track phones and a massive uh, financial investigation, right. which is huge just in and of itself. And so all of those things are happening concurrently uh, and progressing at different speeds, uh, you know, a as, we, as we move forward. Um, the arrest, you mentioned the arrest of Lori Vallow, that, that was critical in that we felt um, because they were completely uncooperative, um, nobody would talk to us on, in that inner circle. Uh, so we were looking very hard to find a mechanism, a charge, something that would um, give us a little bit of traction 
to see if we could get a reaction or a response from either Chad Daybell or Lori Vallow. And ultimately, Rob Wood, very forward thinking, um, really, really devoted, uh, dedicated uh, prosecutor, all of them were, um, but he came up with that idea of, I've got a way that we can, there's a, there's a legitimate crime that we've, we've identified and we can move forward with a charge. Once she was arrested, did you expect her then to cooperate? Well, we had hoped that that would be the case. Typically, when someone is charged, they get legal counsel. And then you can work with their legal counsel under established parameters to determine, you know, is this person willing to cooperate? What can we, what, what might we be able to, um, to do to resolve this matter. If, if the kids are safe and well, then l let's just find that out and, right. and, and move forward. But absent some sort of legal process, we didn't think we were going to get there. So she's then arrested, and <clears throat> I remember around the time, maybe she had already been arrested or around that week, the FBI, to me, took the unusual step of putting out a news release asking for photos and videos from mm -hmm. Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> I don't know if I'd ever seen anything like that. I'm sure yeah. it's happened, but this, and there was a specific website where people could go and upload their photos and videos. Yeah. Was the investigation at that point leading toward Yellowstone? Yeah. It was. Yeah. Um, and we were wrong on that, uh, but we had worked very hard um, to try to identify a point in time that was our, our last known verifiable time that both of those children were alive. And we had various ways to do that. But through the iCloud, we had photos and videos that were dated. So we knew, we knew as of certain dates that, that Tylee and JJ were both alive. And then we looked, okay, what, what beyond that date can we find? And, and so we were able to establish what we believe was the last known sightings of both of those children, you know, independent of one another. With Tylee, um, we had these photographs and videos that were taken around the Old Faithful uh, site in Yellowstone. But as we tracked the travel of, of uh, Alex and Lori and, and JJ and Tylee that day, we had some video of them arriving at the park, but it's in, you know, it's, it doesn't clearly show everybody who's in the truck. Right. And then we could see their travel throughout the park. And we had no idea if Tylee left the park alive. We knew she was at a certain place in the park at a certain time, and that's what we knew. And so then we could see additional travel and then exiting, and there was some strange deviations on the way back home as well. And so, um, you know, it's, a, it's an enormous national park right. with lots of animals and lots of hot geysers. Geysers and, yeah. and remote places. And so we, we spent, um, we spent a lot of time uh, coordinating with the park uh, authorities and we had actually uh, made arrangements to go into the park before it opened the next season uh, to uh, conduct a pretty massive, what was being prepped for a pretty massive search operation inside Yellowstone. Wow. Um, fortunately, we didn't have to, to do that. Um, but it's a great demonstration of the complexity of this case. I mean, it's just just that single piece, that one undertaking. Um, it, it would have been unimaginable, you know, to most people, how how much effort that takes to contemplate searching an area that size, given the information that we had. I can't even imagine. I mean, yeah, that would have taken forever. So, do you think that they maybe had? plan to do something with the children in the park? No. You don't, I don't think so? I don't think so. They just went up there to sightsee? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, then of course we know that within a day or two, Tylee was uh, disposed of in Chad's backyard, mm -hmm. and then JJ a few weeks later. Um, where were you on June 9th of 2020? I was there. At the property? Yeah. And did you think that morning that you would find those kids that day? You know, there was so much um, back and forth amongst the investigative team. Um, I felt very, very comfortable that we had established sufficient probable cause to get the search warrant. Um, and as we, th this was the day, the two days of the search were the culmination of months of effort. And to me, those, th that search sort of encapsulates what this case was all about in terms of all of the different efforts that had been made by everyone involved in the case that led up to us locating the children. There's no one person, no one event that can claim sole ownership for this is, this is what got us here. So, you know, we had done interviews. We had done our cast, initial cast analysis, which showed um, Alex on the property on certain dates. But showing Alex on the property is meaningless unless you correspond that with the last known sightings of JJ and Tylee. So that's a critical piece. We've got to find out when's the last time we saw Tylee or JJ alive. Oh, we have this date now. This date becomes important to us. So we have a piece of a timeline. Then we have an analysis of phones that corresponds with visits to the property and this timeline we've been establishing. Then we're analyzing dozens and dozens of electronic devices, phones, computers, things that were seized in the January search warrant. So you have this search warrant that occurred almost six months previously. We're still in the process of culling through all of this massive amount of electronic data. And you can't just do a keyword search. You, you know the text I'm talking about, right? No keyword would have caught that, but what does that tell us? Well, we have a cast analysis, we have a last known sighting of Tylee alive, and now we have a text message from Chad to his wife that explains why he's burning and digging on the property the very next day after the last known sighting of Tylee alive. So all of these pieces from all of these people working together fit into place. So that puzzle begins to be built. And then you say, okay, this is really compelling. Let's, let's apply for a search warrant. So no, I didn't know. It seemed kind of incredulous to me that they, of all the places in southeastern Idaho, um, that you would put bodies there. Um, but um, I was pretty confident, um, you know, we located JJ's grave very quickly, uh, very early on in the search. And, you know, so it was, it was a very um, interesting, you know, kind of a compelling moment. It, it, like, it, you were taken aback that he's actually here. Were you right there? Where, where were you on the property? Were you like assigned a task? So, um, yes, my, we, had, we knew the two spots that right. we were going to concentrate on, but we initially walked the entire property. So the search is conducted by the, the FBI's evidence response team, but it's a massive property. And so they're the experts, but they also task out law enforcement officers of, hey, you know, do this, do that. Um, I had uh, had some previous experience um, working violent crimes on Indian reservations, and part of that training is actually identifying clandestine grave sites. Right. And so, as myself and another Indian country agent uh, walked the property, we knew uh, both of us had been to this school 
there are certain things that you look for if you're trying to identify a, a potential clandestine grave, and we saw that pretty quickly. Right where JJ was. Right where J, JJ was buried. Yeah. And that was one of the spots where Alex's phone had been. Yeah, his phone had been there, but you could see very clearly um, the vegetation was different in a specific shape. And when you got down on your hands and knees and looked, you could feel a seam. Uh, and then as soon as we peeled back that first layer of sod, you could see that all of the uh, roots from that tree that was right there had been clipped. I knew that, I didn't know we had JJ, but I knew something man may, you know, s somebody had taken Did the sod up and it. cut cut the roots. And we have these probing rods and you could probe the soil around JJ's grave, but you could not and you know, unbeknownst to me, there's rocks and a board over the body, and that's what the probes were hitting. Unbelievable! Wow. So once you realize it is him, I'm sure every sort of emotion you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was um, well, you're heartbroken as a parent, right. as a human being, um, and we didn't know. Have you seen the autopsy photos? I did in the first. Trial, okay. Yeah. Um, when you're exhuming a grave, you're not examining, like you're just getting it out so that you can get it to the coroner's office. So right. we, uh, at that point, I didn't have... You know the condition of the body. No. Yeah. We, we knew, we, we, um, we cut very slightly into the plastic to verify that, that it was human remains versus something else because we needed to take immediate action. Um, and so that's all we did. So we just knew that he was wrapped in, in plastic garbage bags at that point, but we knew it was him. Mm -hmm. We knew we'd found him. Um, and so uh, there's a sense of relief. Months of work have, have led your, the, the combined work of all these good people have led us to this point. Um, tremendous sadness. Um, and then um, you know, you have a duty to perform, and so there's more work to be done. Lots, lots more work to be done, and uh, and so, you know, that that involved getting Chad into custody immediately, uh, which we were set up to do, um, and and then we still had another full day and a half. Uh, as I said, we found JJ in the morning. Uh, and, and then we had started locating remains for Tylee later that afternoon, but Tylee's burial site was much, much more difficult for, uh, to, to excavate. And then just it involved very painstaking sifting and, and um, digging and, uh, yeah, so that was, it was two long days. I know, uh, maybe I'm just asking you to put on your guessing hat here. Why do you think they did what they did to Tylee versus JJ? Um, my personal opinion is that um, they had never disposed of a, of a body. And so I think in their mind, oh, if we burn it, we're going to get rid of the evidence. And they had no idea the amount of heat and flame and time that it takes to consume a, a human body. So I think that was an error on, uh, you know, it was a mistake in their judgment that they thought we'll just bring her out here and we'll burn the body and poof, all of the evidence will be gone. And then they found out very quickly that that's, that it's, that's why crematoriums work the way they do, right. you, you, you know, and so I think it was a failure on their part. And then they had to come up with a, a plan B, which was to, you know, dismember and then bury the, the various parts. So I think they, they knew the first experience was uh, a, a, a catastrophe for them, and so they did it differently the second time. They're much less labor intensive and yeah. get it done. So then you have a whole new part of the investigation because mm -hmm. you've found the children, mm -hmm. you have both suspects in custody, mm -hmm. and your, one of your main uh, 
parts of the investigation was to go through Lori's iCloud. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody to, to, so that we get an understanding. Like you said a second ago, it's not like you're doing a, a keyword for children or raccoon or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's n not that. What, no. are, what are you doing to go through her iCloud? How big was the iCloud? Uh, massive. So we have some software that will take the iCloud and arrange it into its component parts. For instance, your contacts. So there will be a list of contacts, voicemail messages, photographs, videos, um, text messages, media messages, uh, chats, emails, uh, cookies, uh, Bluetooth. I mean, and so you take each of those components and you'd go through those. Some didn't take very long, but a lot of them. Um, the only parameters we would put is we knew when Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow met. So we didn't look too far prior to that date. Right. And so that enabled us with one of the accounts to, to limit the print. Because you had 15,000 photographs. You know, it, that it's a big number to and go you through. Have to click on each one. Yes. Click, oh yeah. Exit. Yes. Click. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then videos, thousands of videos and thousands of text messages, and then you had thousands of chats. Well, within a chat, a single chat could count, could contain several thousand text messages. Yeah. Oh and so it was just this painstaking process of. Um, attention to detail and going through literally line by line for every single message uh, and pulling out those ones that that were relevant to the case and saving those yes and then I guess what would you get together with the other investigators and discuss them like is this one relevant is this one not or uh, not so much because that was kind of my, everybody had a, a bunch of different assignments and so the iCloud was what I was primarily working on from an investigative uh, function. And so um, we would share those things and we had a lot of discussions about relevancy. There's a lot of the iCloud that wasn't, that, that could have, that was relevant that we didn't use uh, just because there was so much material. I think we used the stuff that was deemed to be most important to the case. Um, but, but that, yeah, so it was just a, it's just a, in, in today's world, um, with all of the digital records that were, that, that exist, it's a, it's a painstaking process to get through, um, you know, an iCloud that has data going back years and years and years. There's several texts that, several texts that you testified to in both trials that that were brought up, uh, turning up the heat mm -hmm. on the uh, inflicting pain on the mm -hmm. kids, um, the raccoon text that came out during the the trial, um, the storm text, of course, that mm -hmm. came out. Were there any that, as you're going through them, that really just like kind of hit you, like whoa? Yeah, I, I mean. Two primarily series of texts. The first was when when they started talking about death percentages, um, and they're talking about real people who have died, and and it was very clear to me from the verbiage that was used as it relates to JJ. Um, you know, he's barely in his body. He's he's part way through the veil. Um, those kinds of things. Um, we knew they were talking about the deaths of these children. Uh, at least that's my belief. Um, and then secondly, that the text that I think is most uh, pertinent is, you know, Lori's question to Chad, is there a perfectly orchestrated plan to take the children? Um, she's asking about their, their deaths, you know, uh, their, their murders. Um, I don't know, you know, and and we're not looking at these texts in a vacuum. We're we're looking at the texts in conjunction with the totality of the investigation that everybody's been working on. And so we know from the interviews of Melanie Gibb and and some of these other people, some of the, the you know Zulema, and so we knew about the dark entities and the castings and all of those different things. 
uh, we knew the children had been murdered. So if you know the children have been murdered and you're seeing messages like that, then it adds context and meaning to those messages right. that you might not have had if we didn't have the children located in the state that they were in. What was some other stuff that maybe didn't make it into the trial that you found interesting that was on the cloud? Oh, there, I mean, there was tons of stuff about the um, religious philosophies, and we debated and had a lot of uh, discussions about how far into this do we go, how important is this to a jury um, to understand, you know, what's behind this. Um, not, you know, and who's to say how much they actually believe this stuff. Right. Um, Just that they consider themselves gods, goddesses, that a lot of talk like that, or? Yeah, again, the, these, are, these are personal opinions, but I, my view is that, you know, Chad Daybell used this as a way to uh, inflate his ego and to manipulate Lori. And, you know, you saw that at the trial. Lori manipulated him uh, with, with sex, and he manipulated her with his, you know, supposed uh, status as a visionary or a prophet or whatever, you know, you may want to, or he may want to call himself. Um, but as you looked at the, the doctrines or whatever you want to call that they were espousing, you could see that it was done to accomplish certain things and to justify certain actions that are not justifiable at all. And so that was the back and forth of well, how much of this do we introduce to show, you know, people have a freedom of religion, uh, of course. We're not judging their religious beliefs, but when you see them take something like that and twist it around to make murder seem like you're doing the person a favor by setting them free, you know, look at the Tammy text. Right. Tammy's in limbo. She's very frustrated. She, you know, makes it look like they're doing Tammy Daybell a favor. Right. So, um, so yeah, I, I, you know, those, those are the things that the jury didn't see. There was so much of it. You couldn't, you couldn't include all of it. Wow. And so we, we tried to make sure that we presented the jury with sufficient information for them to make the, to deliberate and make their decisions. Um, but the, the trial would have been days longer if we really would have included all of that stuff. Right. Yeah. Were some of the conversations nauseating? Um, Lovey dovey. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, you know, again, you're, you're performing a task that's important and so those kinds of things kind of you you just you read them you passed over them and you got got back to looking for what's really relevant had the iCloud not been enabled mm -hmm. how detrimental would that have been to the case that's a good question uh, i think the iCloud played an important part i think we still I think we still would have ended up in the same place uh, to some extent. Um, in both trials, I was the, the one of the final witnesses, right. and, and we were very careful to abide by all the court's rules. So I haven't seen anybody else's testimony. Still haven't done no. to watch. Not no. interested? I'm busy. You, you I, don't, have time. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't have time. So, uh, you know, it, it's funny because the perspective I have is my perspective right. because the prosecutors and the other witnesses, we were all very, very uh, cautious and cognizant uh, not to um, talk about our testimony, not to listen or what, you know, so I get the newspaper every single day. I didn't read us, not once did I read an article about the case. I didn't look. So my friends, my family had a much better view full picture. the full picture of the case so uh, I it's hard for me to answer that question because I didn't get to see the content of the other witnesses right. testimony I mean I know it from I've read the interview reports and those kinds of things as part of preparing for uh, preparing for the trial but um, it would have been a harder 
it would have been much harder without the, those communications. I think the, the communications between Chad and Lori are very important. You mentioned working with all these other agencies. Are you all having meetings and saying, all right, we're here? Yep. We met every month, sometimes more than once a month in person for multiple days. We would have tasks that were assigned uh, to people and they would report their progress on their various tasks and, and we would um, just sort of chart our progress and we would wait for things to be done. It takes time uh, because, let me give you just an example. So if I'm remembering correctly, the, the phone uh, with the text message about the raccoon I want to say that phone had 54,000 text messages and you got to <laughs> so it's not like you get through that in a day uh, you have to and I think that's the only text we pulled out of uh, out of that whole thing um, and so it just it takes a, a long long time uh, to get through all of these things and all of the journals and all, everything that was seized during the, the search warrants that were served. Um, and so as we would meet each month, uh, it was great. It was um, this, this, and I know others you've talked to have, have repeated this, but it truly was a, a group effort. Um, there were people involved, um, you know, from the Madison County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, there was somebody who had to keep track of all of our discovery, every document, every photograph, every search warrant, all of that had to be provided, uh, you know, to, to the defense at some point in time once charges were, were made. And so there just, I mean, terabytes worth of information that we were accumulating, tracking, and then ultimately had to provide. And so as we progressed, um, we had a delay because of COVID, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately we uh, set a grand jury date, and um, that grand jury date was almost a year after we found the children. Grand jury is a secret proceeding. We can't really talk about the contents of that, but, but that was a multi-day event with a lot of witnesses that, that appeared and testified in front of the grand jury, and the grand jury ultimately um, uh, you know, issued an indictment. So, And up until a few weeks before Lori's trial in 2023, this case was combined. It mm -hmm. was always the two of them. And I think one of the questions a lot of people have still to this day is, who was leading who, Chad or Lori? After your investigation, do you think one was in charge of the other, or not in charge, but leading the other? Um, I think that that role probably switched back and forth. Um, you know, I I think that Chad Daybell uh, played a leadership role in, in this. Uh, I think that's pretty well established that he was the source that all of these people would go to for answers to their questions. If you look at the trial testimony, you'll see that these inquiries were made to Chad Daybell, uh, seeking answers. Um, and, and so uh, I believe he had a, a leadership role, uh, but certainly, um, you know, Lori was fully uh, in line with that um, and, and the outcome. Uh, there was no hesitation on her part. Uh, in fact, the opposite many times. She was very impatient for them to get to where they ultimately wanted to be, you know, living their fantasy life on a on an island. Right. Um, what did you think when those trials were severed? I was, um, you know, that's, that's a decision uh, that the judge makes for uh, reasons that, that he evaluated. So, uh, you know, it's not my place to, um, you know, to, to have any criticisms there. I, I was disappointed. I, I wanted to see them tried. It, it's a conspiracy. I wanted to see them tried together as co-conspirators. Right. But, um, you know, it, it, once it was severed, we just said, okay, it's severed, and let's focus on one trial at a time. Were you surprised Chad Daybell got death penalty? No, I wasn't. Do you think Lori would have? Probably. But again, I don't get too... We're the fact finders. You right. know, we, we do the investigation, and... and 
uh, we participate clearly in that trial process, but a lot of those decisions um, are kind of in the hands of other people as to why they're pursuing those courses and, and those charges. And, and our job is just to conduct the highest quality investigation that we can and provide our findings uh, to, to the prosecutors who then evaluate those findings for the appropriate legal um, actions. All right. Yeah. What, what's one or two things that you learned doing this whole thing for the past four and a half years? There's a lot of great people out there. I, I hadn't uh, worked in, in my capacity I covered 34 counties. I couldn't possibly meet. There's, there's well over a hundred different law enforcement agencies in those 34 counties. Um, so uh, I hadn't met or or uh, interacted with the Rexburg Police Department or the or the Fremont County Sheriff's Office. Um, I had to a limited degree with the Attorney General's office, but um, just to just the quality, uh, the character of the people who were involved in this case, gives you um, some pride in in this profession and that there are a lot of people who will give their all and then some uh, to to see a case uh, you know to its conclusion despite the setbacks and despite the the difficulties and the hardships and we had plenty of obstacles that we encountered during the course of this investigation so I think that's one of the things that stood out to me was just um, these cases tear your heart out uh, there the, you know over the course of a career, I think you accumulate some baggage. Um, these kinds of cases add to that baggage. But what I've also found is in those cases that um, require the most of you, that, that require you to give the most of yourself, um, those are the cases where when you look back, um, those bonds that you've forged with the people that were shoulder to shoulder with you in in bringing the case to a, a conclusion, those are meaningful. The, the the harder the case, the more meaningful those associations become. Mm -hmm. So that was that was special. Um, and then I just just the opportunity to help uh, the FBI. That's this is what we specialize in in terms of long term, complex, multi subject cases. And so uh, the lion's share of the investigative work was done by Fremont County and, and Rexburg Police Department, but we were with them and um, helped them and helped navigate how do we organize uh, this monster of a case and how do we account for um, all of the leads and discovery and everything that we need to, to produce uh, at the end of the day. And so the FBI had a, a, a role to play that, um, that was complemented well by the work uh, that was being done by Rexburg uh, PD and the AG's office and Fremont County and then ultimately uh, Social Security and others who, who were brought into the case. Do you have any thoughts on what happened to Tammy? I mean, we know how she died, asphyxiation, but mm -hmm. was it Chad, was it Alex? Um, I have some thoughts. I probably just, <laughs> I, well, I don't want to speculate on that. I mean, right. I have some thoughts, but, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm glad uh, that they came to that, con that the medical examiners arrived at that conclusion, because I, I think it's clear that's what that was. Right. Um, and, and so that was important to, to finally, um, to finally f have that piece, uh, that, that, um, report w was important, and that was almost a year after the fact that, yeah. that we waited for that conclusion. Big, big, big development uh, yeah. from them. What about Alex? I mean, do you think, again, this is me yeah. asking you to yeah. speculate, if he was still alive, do you think he maybe would have turned on Chad and Lori? You think he would have gone all the way? We've had three trials. Boy, that's a good question. I, d I don't know. Um, yeah, I, it's, it, it, it really, you know, it depends on, on uh, how he viewed his situation and, and what was, 
I, I can tell you this, the more people there are involved in the conspiracy, the more likely you are to get somebody to cooperate. Interesting, yeah. Especially, I would think, when you've got a couple that, a yeah. couple and then a third outsider. Right. Right. That outsider, I would imagine, would be more likely to yeah. turn unless one of the lovers feels jilted or something. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I know early on you wanted to talk to Chad and Lori. All the investigators did. Do you have any desire to at this point? At this point? No. I have no use to speak with either of them. You think you'd get anything out of them? No. As an investigator, as an interviewer, I would have wanted to crack at an interview prior to. Right. Um, but... After the fact, no, I don't need any, I wouldn't need any association or conversations with them. Right. So what is that first day back in the office after the trial like? Um, inbox is full and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of emails. And there's, yeah, uh, the world keeps turning. Uh, you know, it, it's, you, you take a moment... Um, uh, to be grateful, really, uh, in, in my case, uh, grateful for uh, the work of the jury. Um, I will tell you I had, so again, in Lori's trial, I was, I think, the second to the last witness, mm -hmm. so I had really no optics in what was going on in that trial. Um, and I testified twice in, in Chad's trial, but as we... Um, were allowed to go in for the closing arguments. Uh, there were three jurors from Lori's uh, trial who were there that I'd never met. Uh, they, they introduced themselves and I had a chance to visit with them. And that uh, just, it's so rare. I, I've been doing this for 29 years. I can think of one other trial where I had a member of the jury call me to, to visit one time in my entire career. So witnesses, law enforcement officers, and juries, there's a, there's a gigantic wall in right. between them. And so to, to have the opportunity to visit with a couple of the jurors uh, on Lori's case um, and to hear, you know, for us, we have a duty to perform and you see these horrible things and you've got to figure out, okay, how do I move forward and and there's a lot of power in being an advocate for someone who no longer has a voice and that's what we are so when Tylee and JJ and Tammy can no longer speak for themselves that's how I view it is that we're there we, we become their advocate uh, to to seek whatever justice there might be for them and that helps you deal with what you have to deal with um, the jury is a little bit of a different story. And so to, uh, you know, I, I felt at the conclusion, I felt very grateful for their service, how long of a trial that was. I knew what they had to see, mm -hmm. which is not part of the normal course of human life to, to see those things. Um, and it, it, it just felt... Um, It felt good that I, it's not over. It's never, you know, there's going to be appeal after appeal and there's other things going on in Arizona. But, but for nearly five years, we had been working on this case. And that's a long, that's a long time. Uh, and, and so to, to have two trials uh, of that length and complexity, uh, to have two different juries come back with their findings, um, it, it felt... Uh, it felt good to be part of that effort, uh, to be one of those people who uh, played some small role in, in, in being an advocate for those people who, whose lives were, were taken from them. And so, you know, for me it was, uh, that's why I love this profession, is, is that we can, um, we can serve our, our community in that way. And uh, that was, that was primar primarily how I felt, was just, um, just grateful to have been able to um, be one of those people who got to, uh, I don't want to say got to, but who was called upon to 
participate in, in a case of this nature and and uh, to see it through, just just to finish it. So one of the other cases that you have done, uh, worked on, is when two little kids disappeared in was it two thousand five somewhere around there, mid two thousands. What well, give us the backstory for those people that aren't familiar with the case? Uh, that was a case involving a subject named Joseph Duncan, who was a serial killer of children. Um, and he, um, he kidnapped um, two children and, uh, and then murdered stepfather, mother, and older brother. Uh, and so uh, Shasta and Dylan were the two that were, they were eight and nine years old at the time, and they were kidnapped and it was just a massive, massive uh, investigation. And so... Um, and where was it? Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Coeur d'Alene, Northern Idaho. And then he took the children into uh, Montana. And um, how did he know the family? No connection to them whatsoever. None. He was driving uh, to Seattle to visit his mother and uh, going westbound on I-90 and saw those two children out in a little kitty swimming pool and that was all it took for him uh, and he went on to Seattle eventually came back and couldn't couldn't get those kids out of his mind and so he uh, went in and and murdered their family and kidnapped them so he actually went to Seattle yeah. for the visit yeah and then came back yes so where were you at your point in your career so I was uh, in north central Idaho uh, in a smaller office in Lewiston, uh, but we were supervised out of Coeur d'Alene. So when that uh, crime was committed, it was all hands on deck for the duration, basically. Uh, and that one was shorter. That, that happened in uh, May, and uh, Shasta uh, was recovered uh, alive the uh, 4th of July weekend. Now the ensuing investigation took a number of years right. and multiple trials, both at the federal and state levels, um, death penalty case. Um, but that one was very intense, you know, from day one up until when she was recovered and then subsequently finding the remains of her brother and the campsites and other things that that uh, went into that investigation. And again, I, I played a role um, in that, as did dozens of other people. Right, so when a child goes missing, I learned this in the Baybell case, actually, the FBI steps in? We, um, we don't step in to take over, because right. you don't know whether, you have, like in this case, with, with, that we've been discussing with the Daybells, is we don't, you don't know day one if there's going to be a prosecution, or if it's going to be a federal prosecution, or if it's going to be a state prosecution. You don't predetermine those outcomes. And so what we found is that when children go missing, um, that there are very frequently, that they cross state lines, which brings a, a federal nexus to it, but we don't want to wait until we've verified a federal Nexus. So the, the response now is that when you have a, a child go missing, and in that one, I mean, it was clear we found, you know, the mother, brother, and stepfather were bound and, and murdered. So we knew it wasn't like they had wandered off. We knew we had something really terrible. And so um, the FBI comes in, but we worked that one with the Kootenai County Sheriff's Office. The, the command post was in the Sheriff's Office, and we just... Uh, are the best partners we can be. We have certain resources federally that that our state and local, you know, city, county, tribal partners don't have, and they have certain things they can do that they're better at. Uh, and so we just we we partner with them and try to bring the 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 resources that we have, the expertise we have in in missing child cases to to bear. Uh, to try to get to the best resolution as quickly as possible. How did you find Joseph Duncan? We didn't. So he, he had taken those children to a very remote campsite in the mountains of Montana and uh, 
murdered Shasta's brother there. Um, and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, he, he brought her back. And so uh, it was a waitress from Denny's who recognized her and called the police, and, and they took him into custody. So, a waitress in, in Coeur d'Alene? Mm-hmm. They just happened to know who she was? Yeah, I mean, it was widely publicized. Right. Um, there were posters of the kids everywhere. But, uh, but yeah, she... Um, she recognized her and did the right thing, and and uh, so that was that was how she was found. Um, it wasn't wasn't because we had done something brilliant and learned who he was. It I mean, he had no association of any kind with that family. None. No, and not a single phone call. Nothing. And so, and this is back. You know, we're we're dealing with a lot different technology right. in the early 2000s than we are in 2019. Right, 2000. no smartphones. Right, right. And the fact, it, it's just unbelievable that he did come back to Coeur d'Alene, to northern Idaho. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, he was sentenced to death, and he died on death row. No, he wasn't executed. He actually died, I think, of cancer. Died of a brain tumor. Oh, brain tumor, yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. 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 So two high-profile cases in your career, probably more. Am I missing any? <laughs> there, there's a few others, but uh, you know the Joseph Duncan case was very um, helpful to me in the role that I played in in the Daybell case. It, it uh, when you have these these cases with massive numbers of of manpower and different agencies and coordinating all the paperwork and reports and and tasks um, so those are those were valuable experiences that I think um, helped um, in, in the Daybell case to um, to bring that experience uh, with me and share with with the others who were involved in the case for both of those cases when they started when you started working on them did you think they would be as high profile or as big as they were like, could you tell no. with Daybell, like, this is going to be big, or with Shasta Groney, okay, this is going to be big? You kind of get that point when, when the media starts showing up and staying with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a sense, yes, when you see the, that the media is, has uh, developed an interest in the case and that they seem to be uh, staying with it. And, and so that was, you know, for both of those, there was a lot of, of media attention uh, with those cases. And, and so in the sense you, you know that something big is, is happening, but, um, but your focus is really, uh, I mean, this is the first time I've spoken with anybody from the media, uh, really, uh, since the, the Daybell case concluded. So our focus isn't on the media or what the media is doing. Our focus is on just uh, working the case right. and, and trying to trying to figure it out. And and these are both the Duncan case and this one were both very very difficult. But we also saw just tremendous uh, investigative work done by the detectives and and uh, the analysts and the support folks that that what they were able to track down and piece together and then ultimately present to a jury, um, that's, what, that's what ultimately wins the day, um, is that, a, that level of detail, that attention to detail, and, and just not compromising on, on anything. And, and so I think in both of those cases, the investigators that were assigned you know, adhered to that standard uh, of work, and uh, and that's what that's what brings a complex case to to a successful conclusion. Right. Um, so uh, difficult things to to deal with, but um, but again, you feel good about um, being able to contribute in some way, shape, or form. Um, to, to holding those people accountable and, and to serving the cause of justice in, in cases where it matters most. I, I mean, you're, 
as an investigator, I think when you're when you're dealing with homicides, that's and I've I've investigated or participated in several homicide investigations. That's it doesn't get much more serious than that because the consequences of a mistake can be pretty significant. Right. And so you've got to bring your A game, and uh, and that's what everybody did certainly in the Daybell case and in in the Duncan case and. And uh, and so, you know, they're they're significant, sort of personally and professionally, because of uh, what's at stake if you get it wrong. So, how do you unwind and not let this mess with you mentally? I mean, I see you you're, you're a runner, or a biker. I mean, run yeah. pre pretty physically fit. I mean, is that one of your outlets? Um, I think I think each person is different, and um, I think that at some point, um, you know, does that dam break? I <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I I haven't reached that point. Uh, you know, for me, um, there is a when, when you raise your hand and you swear an oath to. Um, uh, well and faithfully execute the duties of your office, meaning as an agent or a sheriff's deputy or, or a detective or a police officer. Um, for, for me personally, that's very, very meaningful. And I think those are the things that give you the strength um, to persevere through a, a difficult case like this. A lot is riding on it. And, it, you know, you know, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? And so, to me, that's what it isn't. Um, it isn't the other stuff. It's it's the weight of responsibility that a law enforcement officer feels. And I know I can speak for everybody at Rexburg and Fremont County and all the agencies that participated in this case, including the prosecutors. That that weight of responsibility was a very real thing. It was felt by all, and everybody, this mattered uh, to us. And so it's different, like I think from where you sit, you see what we did and what we had to be exposed to, and it's shocking. Mm -hmm. It's not that it isn't shocking to us, but, but we have to carry it, we have to finish this, we have to carry it through. Right. That's what's, to me, that's the armor that we have to help us get through this kind of stuff. Right. If you don't have that ar armor, then I, I think maybe you're in trouble. Yeah. But, but for me, it's the responsibility that I volunteered when I entered this profession to, to um, carry, and that is a source of strength. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You're Chief welcome. Deputy Hart, Doug Hart, former special agent, very, uh, very, very good interview. Thank you for chatting Thank with you. me. Thank you. My pleasure.